so it's my honor and pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Holger Hermans. Uh, Holger is a professor at uh, the University of Saarland, or Saarland University perhaps is the right name, uh, and he holds the chair of dependable systems there. Uh, he has had lots of contributions to various fields, uh, including concurrency theory, uh, model checking of probabilistic stochastic systems, lots of other things. Uh, he also holds an advanced ERC grant, and I could keep on uh, praising, singing his uh, song of praise for, for a very long time, but we are here to listen to him. So without further ado, I uh, give the floor to, um, to Holger. We are currently recording this uh, talk, but um, uh, we may also post it on YouTube depending on the permission received. So uh, uh, if you don't want your, your name or your um, picture to appear, you can also always join with a guest account with a different name even uh, and um, listen to the talk. Uh, Seamus, you have a question or? No, okay, it was a mute. Okay, uh, Holger, the floor is yours. Good, I assume you can hear me and you can see my slide, uh, my, my first slide. Um, I uh, I am very happy to be uh, speaking to this to this audience i uh, i am somewhat aware of the project structures that you have there and i i like it a lot um the, that you are doing this this work on on yeah verifiability or verification in a in a context that that also considers uh, not only let's say the machines but also the societal context a bit and so forth i i like this and um uh, yeah, let me let me introduce uh, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about runtime verification for the masses. This is the title that I that I chose. Um, I should say that this is joint work with um, a number of people, um, especially Ben Finkbein and Maximilian Schwenger, who are at the CISPA Helmholtz Center for Information Security, uh, also in Saarbrücken, and Sebastian Biva, Maximilian Köhl, and Janik Schnitzer, who are in my group. And yeah, we together, we did a couple of things that, that I want to uh, report about. This is in the context of something that uh, is somewhat similar, uh, but not really similar. I think Mohamed knows quite well wh what we are doing there. Um, but let's say it is, yeah, but I, I do think it has some similarities, at least in spin and in, in, in scope, and also maybe in dimension to uh, what your um, um uh, funded projects actually uh, are altogether it's the center for perspicuous computing this is a, a, a national initiative uh, funded by the deutsche forschungsgemeinschaft it is called a sonderforschungsbereich so this is um, a special re research activity um, that spans um, the uh, institutes that we have in Saarbrücken and uh, the technical university of dresden and it is in the order of um, 30 to 50 PhD students, roughly, let's say 30 are funded by the Deutsche Versionsgemeinschaft and another 20 we are adding uh, from the universities, basically. And um, the, 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 the motivation, and I should say something about the word perspicuous, basically, for, uh, first, I suppose, right? It is, perspicuous is, an, is a kind of old word uh, that if you want to translate it, you can translate it to, if you need a translation, let's say, right? Um, it, so it's kind of the converse of suspicious, right? It is, uh, it's, it's transparent, interpretable, comprehensible, explainable, plausible. These are the, the, what we mean when we say perspicuous systems. And um, the, the reason why we think this is important, uh, there is this kind of, of, uh, uh, one uh, two line uh, explanation what we mean so what we basically we are seeing that there is thanks to information technology and artificial intelligence there is an explosion of opportunities for software driven innovations nowadays uh, but this comes with an implosion of the human opportunities and capabilities to understand and control these innovations right and in order to counter that we uh, feel that there is a need for what we call perspicuous computing so so and this includes verification, uh, but it also includes more, namely explanation, for instance. It, it is divided over different um, phases of the design and use cycle. Uh, uh, I sh yeah, maybe I should tell you who is who is driving this. So we have a, we have uh, 18 PIs. Some of them uh, you may know, like this is Joel Oaknin, this is Crystal Bayer, this is Christoph Weidenbach. 
maybe you, you know your Kaufmann, he's in AI, uh, Matthias Hein in, in machine learning, Bernd Finkbeiner, right? So Bernd, Joel, Christel, Christoph, they are in verification, basically. Then um, who else do we have here? We have Rupak Majumdar, um, we have Maria Christakis, uh, Markus Krötsch, he's, he's in description logics, Franz Bader also is there. Uh, and then there are some people that you may not know so well. They are they are from uh, human computer interaction, for instance. Um, and and these these PIs they are from from yeah places in Saarbrücken or from the Technical University of Dresden. Uh, we together do this. Um, we are currently extremely busy. We have this. We have, we have planned to run for twelve years, and the first four years are nearly over. We are at the beginning of the fourth year, and we have to reapply for the next four years, and then for another four years if we are successful. So we are extremely busy nowadays with with uh, with evaluating where we stand and projecting into the future. I will not talk much about this, um, but what we are basically what what we what how we are dividing our scientific landscape is basically we are distinguishing design time, runtime, and inspection time. Uh, inspection time is especially in case something goes wrong, so to speak, and you have to find out what went wrong, right? So, and there are different stakeholders at these different uh, phases. So you have like the system designers and software engineers at design time. At runtime, you just have the lay persons. And then inspection time, you may have uh, lawyers, data forensic experts, domain experts, and so forth that are looking at these, at these systems and what they are doing. And uh, we we are striving for uh, understanding at design time, plausibility at runtime, and let's say justifiability. So uh, what part of what has happened is justifiable and what is not at inspection time. So this is roughly how we structure our our um, uh, landscape, let's say, and, and the projects that we are running under this umbrella of the Center for Perspicuous Computing. Um, and one example. Uh, that I am uh, presenting today, uh, basically, is uh, at, at runtime. So we have different examples, but this example here will be at runtime. It's actually about runtime verification. And uh, you will see along the talk, basically, what this is about. Um, it starts, it is about actually things that are that are happening in our cars these days. Um, so um, you may be aware that, let's say, the old technology, so combustion engines, um, are uh, the the main thing that drives our cars these days. Still, even though electric driving and other um, ways of driving are are getting are ga ga gaining traction, um, most cars have exhausts, and these exhausts they produce uh, exhaust gases, right? Like particles or NOx or yeah or or CO gases, and um, well, not all of them are very friendly to your health. Concretely, what is bad about NOx? Uh, now, um, the, it's very, relatively easy if you look into the documents of the European Union, then the bad thing about NOx is that it kills. Um, statistically speaking, right? It doesn't kill right away, but statistically speaking, you can, you can link death rates to concentrations of NOx. Uh, about 400,000 premature deaths every year can be linked to to, to NOx. About uh, yeah, six and a half million uh, fall sick every year because of NOx. And the whole health problem induced by that are in the order of 19.8 billion every year, right? So NOx is actually bad. And NOx is especially produced by uh, combustion engines that are powered with diesel, right? So we're talking about diesel engines mostly. Um, this is the, the, the it is it is a particular problem, and um, well, how is, I mean, there are basically there, there are regulations in place that limit the amount of NOx that is produced by cars in the in the wild, so to speak. But they are not formulated in 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 the wild. They are formulated for relatively precise conditions, and they are actually carried out in a in a kind of lab environment. So every car model that goes on the market until a few years ago, at least, uh, had to go a very specific test that that uh, was basically deterministic behavior um, over twenty minutes in order to determine in a reproducible way what is the amount of gas that is produced during this run, right? So the, 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 the focus was on reproducibility. So therefore, it was effectuated on the, under precisely defined conditions. And for that, the, the vehicle was fixed on, on, a, on a chassis dynamometer. 
And um, uh, well, this is this is what was then enforced. It is the new European driving cycle, and it imitates behavior, let's say, in town. Uh, this is in kilometers per hour, right? I'm sorry if you are used to miles per hour, but I hope you can do the, the, the conversion. So kilometers per hour, uh, 50 is basically rural, let's say, tra uh, traffic, and then, uh, or, or, sorry, or urban traffic. And then here is some sort of motorway for, for a certain uh, short amount of time, it goes to 120 kilometers per hour. And this is in seconds. Um, uh, and this is 20 minutes, basically, right? So this test runs 20 minutes and you see this repeats four times and then comes the, let's say, the more uh, rural and motorway segment. Now, um, to make it short, I guess this, this you have you have heard of that. If you look into uh, uh, certain car models, at least a while back, let's say five years ago, you found uh, certain functions. Uh, for instance, Bosch had had um, um, certain certain codes there that funnily were called the acoustic function, and they were somehow they were relating. Uh, they were they were defining windows. Let's say they were separating the space of trajectories that one can drive, so to speak, into yellow and into white areas. And um, this is now this is now with distance, right? And here's the time in in twenty in is still in seconds, right? And um, now what is the point here? The point here is if you, I mean, this one is in this is more or less is this is is the same graph, but here we have we have speed. And there we have distance, right? So in order to go from speed to distance, you basically have to build the integral uh, over this this function, right? And if you do that, uh, if you if you if you if you build the integral over this here, right? This is what you get. Uh, so basically, if you drive the test on the chassis dynamometer, this is what in distance you will basically do, even though of course you're standing at the same place, right? And uh, of course, you you can guess this already. This fits extremely precisely in one of the these these windows. And in fact, white means don't clean the exhaust, while yellow means clean the exhaust. Right. And the behavior that was actually programmed by Bosch and used by Volkswagen, especially this is the Volkswagen diesel scandal, basically, where we still have court cases in Germany and the and the head of of Audi. Uh, is is uh, is still uh, threatened with 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 court, uh, with, with 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 jail and so on because of that. I mean, this was it was defined in such a way that if once this blue line bumps into um, uh, yellow, then exhaust cleaning would turn off, right? And only if it stays in the white area all the time, then uh, exhaust cleaning stays on. So basically, the Cleaning of the exhaust was strictly conditioned, basically, on the fact that it's obviously the NEDC that is being uh, driven, right? Now, other other companies did it did it different. For instance, um, uh, Porsche and uh, I think it was Porsche and uh, uh, who else? And Porsche definitely. Um, what they did, they looked at the lateral acceleration. And if you are, of course, on a chassis dynamometer, there is no lateral acceleration. And they took this as an indicator that they better clean the the exhaust. And when when a lateral acceleration kicked in, they decided, okay, we can stop because we're not on the on the on the dynamometer, right? Uh, Fiat has a very nice had a very nice way of of cheating in this regard. Um, namely, um, what they did is they um, they stop actually cleaning after 20 minutes, after 22 minutes, not after 20 minutes, but all cars of Fiat that are out there still, they stop cleaning after 22 minutes. They have not changed that and they argue, well, we are passing the test, right? Um, because it's the, the test is only for 20 minutes. Now, um, the, the very interesting behavior. The, the background behind this is that in order to have effective cleaning, you need technology and the technology has side effects. And in particular, the best technology needs a second kind of fluid, the diesel exhaust fluid um, that uh, the, uh, back then was was under, uh, more or less. There was a common understanding that you cannot have a car where you have to refill two fluids uh, that was to be avoided and so forth. Now, um, okay, that was there's a bit of history on uh, on um, this this diesel emission scandal. Now, this is fraud, right? I mean, uh, but actually there is no attacker, right? It's not like in security, the fraud is actually built into the product. It's shipped with the product comes uh, uh, a fraudulent behavior, and um, 
uh, together with some colleagues, uh, uh, we have started to look into this phenomenon and there's a series of papers. One of them, which I'm very proud of, is also with Mohammed. Um, and this is, runs under the flag of software doping. So software doping is to us is a behavior that is not intended but you buy it with your product and then maybe not intended because you don't want it or because society doesn't want it, right? And, and, and you, can, you can do very nice theories um, about this. So in which sense uh, a certain behavior that deviates from another behavior is considered doped software or not. Um, I have decided today not to talk about that so much. Um, I, I want to talk about the runtime verification. Um, and what we are doing there, which is related to the problem domain, but it's not precisely uh, about the software. In a sense, you, you, there, is, there is a connection, but I don't want to want to go into all the theory actually today. Yes. By the way, I allow questions all the time. Um, now, what has happened since is that the the new European driving cycle has been replaced by uh, another version, which is the World Harmonized Light Traffic uh, Travel Profile or something, WLTP. Now, um, this one is uh, still something that is done on the on the chassis dynamometer, right? So it is still it has still the same kind of bad uh, quality. Namely, it's easy to identify that you are actually currently running an WLTP. Which has the good side that it is that, that, that you can compare results. You can take this car, you can take another car, you can say, ah, this, th because it's deterministic uh, profile, you can say this car has this uh, exhaust value or consumption value, and this car has that uh, consumption or, or exhaust value, right? And uh, so, so this is the two sides of the coin. Uh, the WLTP is more realistic, the, it is more, it's closer to real traffic, but it's still, it is a deterministic behavior. Right now, um, uh, entirely different is what is now enforced to happen for cars that have to enter the or that want to enter the European uh, market. And I do believe that uh, Great Britain is not very different in this regard, but I don't know. Right. So um, uh, but let's say for Europe, there, there are there are standardized ways how to do that. And this is. What is rolled out now is RDE. RDE stands for um, real driving emissions. The difference now is that um, the car is no longer fixed to a chassis dynamometer, but instead uh, it's driving on, uh, in the wild on, on normal streets. And for that, the exhaust uh, gases that are produced are collected at the back of the car in a, in a, in a relatively expensive device, actually, th that does the measurement, right? So you're driving around with your own small lab that, that analyzes the gas that is coming out of the, the exhaust pipe. And, uh, well, obviously, this is, this is harder to identify now that, that, you are in, that the car is in such a situation, which is good in order to, to prevent these, these software doping problems. And um, it, uh, of course, comes with a downside that you cannot re uh, reproduce results, right? So you cannot say this car now has the following um, um, exhaust uh, behavior and is better than another car because it really depends on the track that you have been driving. So therefore, only limits are defined. And as long as the car is below the limit, that is considered good, right? Now, um, how does this look? Well, the, 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 such a test track has a few requirements still, right? So, so you cannot just drive arbitrarily. There's a certain minimum time and maximum time. There's a certain length uh, restrictions and so forth. Concretely, uh, uh, there, yeah, well, there are a number of, well, I will come to that actually, there are a number of, of, of constraints that have to be satisfied. And then there is a question, once you have driven these, this RDE, so you have actually completed like 90 minutes, then there is a question, was this a, a valid trip or not? According to the requirements, I will come to them. Or is it uh, an invalid one? If, there's, if, if it is a valid RDE, then the question is, is this limit exceeded? The limit is at 120 milligram per kilometers or at 168. There are two limits and they depend on the date when your car actually was was uh, uh, put on the market in, in, in Europe, right? So this has been reduced from 168 to 120. So they they have the same function, but one limit applies to your car. It's either 120 or it's 168, 
right? And uh, well, right. You, so you, you can then decide whether whether the limit is exceeded or not. And uh, uh, if it's not exceeded, then it's a good car. And if it is uh, exceeded, then it is obviously a car that should not be on this on the market, right? So that's the idea. Now, um, these. As I say, these RDE specifications, they are actually documents um, that, that detail in natural language what, what uh, an RDE is, actually. Um, they, in a sense, what you can think of, one third is urban traffic, so below 60 kilometers per hour. One uh, 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 third is rural traffic, and one third is motorway traffic, right? And... Um, um, well, at least th then there are more requirements. I'm, I'm slowly going into the requirements. Uh, each of these thirds is at least 16 kilometers long, but it can uh, vary. It can be more, it can be less, right? Um, uh, the whole thing runs, must run at least 90 minutes and uh, at most 120 minutes. And uh, you basically see, I mean, easy, easy way of violating this um, the RDE uh, validity is to go on the motorway and to drive once faster than 160, right? If you have a car that can do that and you have a motorway that allows that, or even if not, you can still try. If you once go above, above 160, then it's no longer a valid test, right? But there are more complicated requirements actually that uh, more or less relate to the fact that we, you actually have to follow the trajectory and you have to do analysis on the trajectory in order to decide whether this is a valid behavior. In the wild, it looks like that. So you have here, you have this, the, the green uh, part is the, is, wait a second, maybe I can, uh, how does this go? Uh, laser pointer here. This here is, this here is, is urban. This, the red one is the motorway traffic and in between is the, is the rural part, right? So that is actually an RDE that is driven in the wild close to our campus. Let me think the campus is, is our, our university campus somewhere here, yeah. Um, right, so you can now actually, if you have the right equipment, you can do the, the RDE test yourself. You have to know what to do and you need more or less the information whether this is a valid RDE test at the end of your, of your trip, but uh, you can do this uh, yourself and I will come to that in a second. Now, here's more details of, the, of these RDE conditions. I said a third should be urban, a third should be rural and the third should be motorway, but actually it's slightly different. It's between 29 and 44 percent, uh, so to speak, should be urban and so forth. Speed range, I think, is clear. Distance, I have already mentioned. And then there are some more pers pers uh, constraints uh, here. Temperature is constrained, so it should not be uh, too hot or too cold. This is, this is in Kelvin, I think, yeah. Uh, it, you cannot do this on, on high mountains, um, right? Uh, duration is clear, and then there is driving dynamics, which is basically uh, is is saying whether uh, how far you you stress the car or not. This is a somewhat complicated thing with a 95 uh, percentile and so forth and so forth, right? But you see, actually, um, this is almost a specification, right? I mean, so for us formal methods people, uh, you could you could think think of this as a specification, right? And uh, indeed. I mean, the whole document has a number of pages, right? And it it spells out in 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 a in English language, but still in in something that you can actually see as as a as a specification document. Spells out obviously what is an RDE. Now the question is, if we want to check for RDE compliance, what do we do? I mean, there is the 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 usual way, of course, is you give this to uh, um, an average programmer, and the average programmer takes this text and produces code and says, okay, look, this is my RDE compliance checker, right? This is uh, one way of doing that. Now the way that is closer to our um, um, uh, view on the world is probably the one where you turn this into a formal specification. And then you have proven technology that generates the code from that formal specification so that you avoid the problem that it's, that it's uh, difficult to understand whether the code really reflects what is in the regulation, right? And this is actually what we did um, some years back. We've, we formalized, a student of mine, Maximilian, formalized the, the RDE regulations to quite some detail, basically. Also, of course, there are the, these typical problems with the consistencies and you have to uh, very carefully decide what this all means and so forth. Um, now, uh, probably clear, I think clear, but I'm happy to discuss this, right? 
uh, when you are having some sort of specification document and you, you code this into a program, then um, this is error prone. This is usually a low level of abstraction and it also lacks in succinctness and in perspicuity. I think we agree there, even though you still have to get used to the word perspicuous. Now, if instead you do this formal on the basis of a, of a, of a specification that is still readable, this is then succinct and precise. It is intelligible. It is less error prone. It is high level of section and it can be used to pinpoint ambiguities, right? And yeah, we, we did this um, and uh, for that we used a language um, for uh, runtime monitoring. The, the language is called Lola and we used the real time extension of this, which is called RT Lola. It is nothing that I myself uh, invented, but I am I know the, the some of the original developers, namely Ben Finkbeiner in particular, who has been doing quite some work there. And there the idea is this is kind of a stream processing uh, system. So you have the input stream and you can think of this like the velocity or the exhaust values and the, the heights over ground and so forth and so forth, right? And you have these, 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 uh, these input streams and you have a runtime monitor that runs over these streams and produces output streams. Uh, and uh, it does so based on a specification that tells you how to turn um, input into output streams, right? And this can become quite complicated. Um, and RT Lola is actually a real-time monitoring toolkit for uh, such type of physical systems and networks. Uh, it supports the processing, evaluation, and aggregation of input data streams. And given an RT Lola specification, the point is that this, this the monitor can be generated automatically, right? And um, so you basically have a provably correct monitor given that your specification is really uh, uh, correct relative to the informal world that, where you started from, right? And these anti load specifications are checked statically for memory requirements, right? So the runtime monitor may need some memory in order to do the work, right? So they're checked for memory requirements, and then they're either directly executed or they're compi compiled onto FPGA. So there are other use contexts, especially there are two companies that are doing um, um, multi-copters that are both actually customers of, of the RT Lola framework. Um, and for them, uh, they, they do this really for for super uh, for surveillance of, of their of their drones in flight. Um, for them, they are compiling this uh, onto FPGA. The language has been uh, um, uh, developed together with engineers. I'm actually, as I say, I'm not really an original developer, but I think it's very, very well done stuff. It's, it's really uh, easy kind of to understand and use. And in a sense, these specifications are equations that are translating input streams into output streams. Or yeah, I mean, just I mean, if you have these kind of input, then produce that kind of output. That's more or less the thing, right? Um, and I have, of course, an example for this. So uh, let's say if this is it is fairly easy, right? I mean, you have a number of of input values, and um, one of them comes is always the velocity. So think of every second comes the velocity, and then you have to decide starting from nothing, what is the maximum velocity driven so far? Well, you have this input and then you say, okay, let's produce uh, an output, right? These are timed, uh, these are type values. And uh, well, for instance, if, if the velocity comes in one by one, then the max veloc ve velocity is, well, you do the maximum of what uh, you had before, starting off with something that doesn't make sense, so to speak, that you have a very low velocity. And then you take always the velocity that comes in, always the one that comes in, right? And what this basically means is that, okay, you start here with, with basically this, okay, you build the maximum, you build the maximum up, so you, and so forth, right? I mean, I think it's kind of clear what's, what's happening there. Let me check the time that I'm not going, okay, woo -hoo -hoo, I, I should probably speed up a bit. Um, now, you can actually imagine that indeed, you can use this for, for instance, the vehicle speeds, the NOx values, the exhaust mass flow, right? So here, this is in parts per million, for instance, and you, this is the amount of, of uh, volume that comes through the exhaust, but measured in, in, in kilogram, okay? And you can do this then in order to really specify all of the RDE, right? It, it, here, this part you can still understand. You have an, you have an urban uh, part. If, if the velocity is basically below 60 and it stays below 60, then you can take the average. You can, if, if for the valid test, you have to do a large conjunction of all these constraints and so forth and so forth, right? Uh, this uh, can be implemented, let's say, and, you, and the, uh, the, 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 the checking procedure tells you this with uh, O of log n update cost and O of n memory. So it's actually uh, still cheap and so, so it's also easy to use. 
And um, now, if you now want to use this, what you need is you need yeah, basically. Question. Sorry. May I ask a question? Yeah, please. Question. So, so in the specification, you have things like acceleration, which I assume are supposed to be automatically ca calculated as derivatives of uh, velocity. How do you handle those? Um, you take the step. I mean, I mean, if you have the speed, I mean, that's. I think we 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 know how to do this. I just uh, forget the name. I think this is what is this? Is this first order uh, kutta? I don't know. You take the neighboring values and you take the difference. So no, you numerically it, calculate it. Yeah, okay. yeah, you do this numerically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the velocity, you 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 uh, from the velocity you you calculate the acceleration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the velocity differences. Yeah, I think that I, I'm sorry that that uh, that I give such a such a um, 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 kind of kind of dumb answer, but I think this is how it's done. Right. No, no, that's fine. That's good. Good. Now, if you want to do it, you need then more or less a runtime monitor, and you still need this this heavyweight equipment, right? Which which you have to put at the at the end of your 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 car in order to do the to do the um, the measurements, basically, right? Now, if you really want to do that, okay, you can actually take the RT Lola monitor from us for free, but you need this thing, and unfortunately, this thing costs you uh, well. This is now in dollars, two hundred fifty thousand dollars, right? Uh, what we then did is instead is we um, we built an something that is much weaker, of course, in the accuracy, but it only costs a hundred dollars. And for that, we used a few Arduinos and so forth and so forth. And what it actually does is it, it uses the fact that that uh, the car car has a standardized interface, the OBD interface, which is a which is a plug that is in the in the in the in the car, basically that the that the gar uh, garage uses for 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 uh, diagnosis. But you can exp it's explicitly designed for exhaust. Uh, uh, supervision, so to speak. So you can you can use that in order to look into your car, um, and you can more or less replace this by that, right? We did this early. Let me speed up a very little bit. Uh, we did this early with an Audi here, and there you see here is the plug, uh, so to speak, and that was all the equipment. And um, this is an, an Audi A7, which has especially an onboard NOx sensor. So by going into this interface here, you can see the NOx value as the car tells you it. And also, this was a car that had a, had a known problem. So we knew that this car was a bad car and it was not fixed, right? And, and for us, it was easy to reproduce the problem. But it's not that we found the problem; we knew the problem. Uh, what was the, what was it? So basically, if um, um, if if you make such a such a, uh, um, a uh, this is an RDE now. This is an RDE that we drove, right? And here, what you see is the is the Knox. Um, uh, values, right? The NOx values. Now, um, what you see here, if if you basically build the the average, you 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 stay well below this 168, which is the limit for that for that car, right? Six 160 is the limit for that car. Now, if you change the car a little, and you see it here, this this diesel exhaust fluid or, or it's urea. If if you drive the same with an almost empty tank, and that was the known problem. Then essentially, this is the value that comes on out, right? So it is also a slightly different RDE that we drove here, right? It's not the same RDE. Why could why should it, right? Um, but here, let's say the 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 average is above the limit of 168. So that behavior should not be there. So in order not to have that behavior, the car should basically no longer drive if the urea tank is empty. And that is in fact the case, the car does not drive if the rear tank is empty. But what the, the, the fix, or let's say the problem that was built in here by Audi was that before it gets actually empty, they stop consuming urea, right? So they basically, they, they I mean, they, you, the car is not allowed to drive without uh, the, the fluid, right? But of course, you can just stop consuming fluids by stopping the, the exhaust cleaning, and then the car can continue because there is still fluid in there, but you don't use the fluid, right? So that was the known problem, and uh, it was easy to reproduce this with our with our technology, basically, right? It was actually difficult to empty the tank. I must say that. I mean, we tried to empty the tank manually. At the end, we had to drive the car until the, the urea got empty. <laughs> so seriously, seriously, this is what happened. So we waited like half a year, and then we come back to, came back to that car. Um, now, uh, yeah, this is a, a, an example of doping. Okay, so that was, let's say, step one, but this is not, this is still, let's say, I mean, um, uh, a bit, 
I mean, look, the hardware that we were using there, there, there was an Arduino there, and there was a laptop, I think, somewhere here and so forth. So this is still um, a, a bit heavyweight, and it's not yet for the masses. But um, the next step that I want to tell you about, I'm pretty proud of that, is we are now really going to the masses. Um, uh, what's the point here? Uh, essentially, we move the behavior, I mean, essentially the runtime monitoring framework moves into an app that you can download from, from Google Play for free, right? So the, so the, 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 the money, runtime monitoring technology is in an app that is shipped to you more or less for nothing. And what you need is you need still the adapter for this so-called OBD port, which is this thing actually, right? So, so, and you can buy this for 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 uh, what is it? For six pounds, you can you can buy that thing, right? And so you can do your approximate, not calibrated, but still indicative um, own RDE test by means of just investing six euros. You can do that, right? And this is more or less the, the story that that uh, comes now. So. Uh, what's, let's spell this out. So these cars are equipped with the standardized diagnostic interface called OBD or OBD2. The sensor readings are exposed via OBD2. Actually, OBD is made for that. And you, 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 you realize that it was made for exhaust emissions by the fact that if you have an electric car, it is not enforced to have OBD. I now have an electric car and it doesn't have OBD. It has the plug, but it doesn't run the OBD protocol while combustion engines must have the OBD and hybrid engines must have OBD, right? So it is meant for exhaust supervision actually, right? Now, then these, these modern uh, selective catalytic reductor systems, they have NOx sensors, right? They, 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 and they expose, at least some of them we know, expose the NOx values over the OBD port. And so that's why you can actually um, uh, reproduce uh, more or less. You, you can you can look into the car and you can see what it does with respect to an RDE, right? And these Brutus adverts, as I say, they are cheap, right? Um, and these are examples. And we we bought a hundred. So if you want, uh, send me a note. I send you one, right? I'm I'm happy to do that. We bought a hundred and we branded them with our project, and we are throwing them out. Uh, basically, we are preparing the reviewers by that by throwing them <laughs> these kind of uh, thingies. Now, um, for that, we needed to make this Artilola run on a on a phone. And well, this is in parts per million. Uh, and actually, what we need is we we need to uh, turn this into into kilogram uh, per per uh, sorry kilogram per ki kilometer or something or, or something like that, milligram per kilometer. I don't remember, but something like that. So we have to do a bit of calculations, and for that you need a few more values that are exposed. And there are actually three to four different ways, dependent on what the car actually offers you. There are three to four different ways to calculate that. Uh, using using physical uh, knowledge, right? Now, um, uh, yeah, as I say, this uh, uh, Artilola now runs on a phone, and in a sense, this this opens a whole uh, new um, uh, set of applications, right? I mean, you can now do uh, you could do instead of, instead of doing runtime monitoring of cars, you could also do runtime monitoring of your heart if you have a, a device that feeds in sensor data regarding your heart frequency into into uh, into the application, right? So the, so let's say whatever sensor data is now in your phone, you could use this to do runtime monitoring. What you need is you need an RDE specification, sorry, a specification you need in in Lola, and you need the engine that then uh, produces the the, the monitor out of that. We have, as you see here, we have combined this also with, with a data donation. Uh, I think I come to that. We have a data donation functionality, let me say it here, uh, that, that so people who are using this app are now actually donating their trips to us so we can actually do statistics. And this happens more and more. Uh, we can do statistics over, over the consumptions and the exhaust and so forth and so forth, right? Um, yeah, this goes to us. So. Uh, I should say that the RD specification is a separate component and you can replace this easily. So it's actually what makes it open for other applications. Um, as I said, there are three. Now, actually, we have four variants um, for different configurations of onboard sensors. Um, and all data is is uh, is locked and stored in a, in a format that we define for that. Um, there's a bit, little bit of analysis that can happen uh, on the device itself. Uh, otherwise, we do off-site uh, analysis, but of course, the check whether it is an RDE, that is definitely on the device, right? This is actually what is happening here. The ITA donations I, I mentioned, uh, and uh, they are fully compliant with, with the GDPR uh, of the European Union. 
Now let's have a bit of a look uh, into how this how this actually uh, how the screens uh, of the app look. This is the the start screen, and here you see if you just want to monitor, if you don't want to do an RDE, you can also do this. You can push on this button, and you then see all the values that your car exposes on the on the OBD, right? So we can look at the speed, for instance, or the or the intake. Uh, air temperature of your of your of your car at the front and so forth, right? And 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 the RPM. And um, so there are two modes. One mode is just monitoring. That is not using the runtime monitoring framework, but it it monitors just it it outputs you the data that comes out of your car. And then there is this RDE which uses the the runtime monitoring facility or runtime verification technology. Um, yeah, here this is where you get the app from. Um, we're happy if you do that. Now here is, is a bit of uh, how to use it. Uh, let me, um, I have now, I think to turn it off here. How do I do this? Uh, I want now this, uh, okay. does it work? No. Uh, uh, yeah. Because I have now this laser pointer on, I can no longer uh, click. How do I do this? How do I turn this off? Anyone knows this? Not really, right? So I should now be able to click here. Do you want to leave the presentation more than ah, it? No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It works. Now here you see if you if you the, the, thanks. The first thing that you have to do is you have to connect your your uh, Bluetooth adapter that was happening here, right? So it was unconnected and it was asking you what do you want to connect to. This is a usual thing, right? Because because the connection between the 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 phone and the and the screen is and and the and the car is this adapter and it goes via Bluetooth, right? Now then, if you start this trip, this is what we are seeing now, right? Then basically this is the screen that you see here after selecting RDE trip, and what you have here is. You have here the total time. Okay, this must be 90 minutes at least at the end. Total distance. You had to check an approximate distance that you want to drive that is needed to to give you a bit of the guides here. And what you see here is now the the currently accumulated NOx value. But since it's a very small distance, this is not very indicative, right? Um, it's also the start of 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 the trip and so forth. So. Here, this is 120 and this is 168. These are the two boundaries. Then what you see here is how much urban traffic you have been driven. Currently, all the thing that you drove is, is urban, rural and motorway, right? And you have basically to reach uh, this point and you should not go over that point. You have to reach this point, but you should not go over that point um, and so forth, right? And then the dynamics, this is interesting because you have, let's say you have two moving windows. So here's one window and there is this ball in between and there's another window um, that currently goes to the very end. And the balls move and the and the bars move. This is our way of representing the, the dynamics that you have to have, right? And at the end of your trip, these balls must be inside these windows that are there, right? It's it's at first use it's it's a bit uh, difficult let's say until you understand this but basically think of this as a as a window here this between the white and the black and this ball here must be in that window and then there is another window white and black and this ball must be in that window and this holds true all over right and so basically while driving you have to make sure that this stays there and then if at some point it is clear that this cannot become a valid trip then this question mark changes to a red cross, while if at some point it is clear that uh, this is a valid trip, namely you have been driven the distance, uh, the, sorry, the time of 90 minutes, you have satisfied all the requirements, then it turns into a green uh, thing, and then you can actually stop your RDE test. Well, here's another shot a bit later. Uh, I'm not sure, maybe, yeah, here you see now how it's happening. So Nox is there. Uh, we are driving urban currently still. Um, and the dynamics has moved a bit and so forth and so forth, right? Uh, let's probably move on. Um, this is, I think, when at the end, um, uh, is it like that? No, it's not yet. It's still, well, the urban is completed now. Rural is there. You can actually mix. You don't have to do urban first. You can mix uh, urban and and rural and motorway. Um, yeah, and then here, this is at the end. At the end, now we have we have we have taken our time. This is more than ninety minutes. We have we have approximately done the distance. We have guessed it to be eighty three. Now it's eighty eight, but that's fine. Um, and uh, basically, this ball is in the right area. This ball is in the right area. They are, they are all right, and so it gives you this kind of uh, tick uh, check mark. And uh, I think it should now. And once this is done, you can stop the RE test. 
it should do that yeah you can stop the RDE test and then changes to some mode which shows you statistics so you have done a valid RDE test right this was the total duration this was the NOx emission which is below the threshold right um and this is what was happening in urban rural and so forth now this is what we are what we are shipping out there and I'm, I'm quite happy even though it's a bit of engineering now and and maybe you can think this is not formal verification and so forth but no i i'm i'm pretty proud of that because it is of course um i mean the 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 the, the market out there is now huge for for our things i can tell you a few stories uh, give me a second your timing is good i can tell you a few stories what has actually happened since um uh, uh, before that, two slides about the the internals. So there is a there is the the uh, a backend basically um, that where which shares the kind of same data format and where we do more analysis, where we can look at the the specs, we can do statistics. We are investing quite heavily in there, and uh, yeah, well, this is dedicated infrastructure to analyze the the diagnostic data, especially for those that are donated to us, of course, right? And there is this format for that. Uh, then, and yeah, well, this is how it looks like, let's say, in our database. Then this is another thing that we built. The problem is if you're developing this app that should run in a car and you always have to get down on your car, down to your car once you have made a change, and then uh, you have to test it and by driving 90 minutes and so forth, this is a bit silly. So what we developed, we developed a kind of in-house uh, simulator that uh, uh, sits inside this 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 funny car, and uh, we use that basically during during engineering in order to to test out new functionalities, uh, so to speak. Um, yeah, if you want to tap into our research, we are we are uh, very happy about that. This is all open source. Um, um, it consists of four parts. Uh, the entire toolkit is written in in in, in Rust. And um, via LLVM, it can be compiled for Android devices. Um, then uh, there is a part um, that uh, that uh, I don't remember what it's for. Ah, it's the RT Loader Interpreter that is written in Kotlin. And then uh, linking with Loader Drives is also written in Kotlin. These are two different parts. Let's say that are different at different places. And then. Um, that if you want to produce Maven artifacts or other things, uh, you can. You can. We have an analyzer basically for the PCDF uh, format. And let's say basically you need these three if you want to do stuff yourself that is slightly different. And if you also want to tap into our data format, then you need that one too, right? Um, another thing that happened now is that that uh, another car manufacturer uh, pointed us to the fact that for hybrid engines, for, for engines that have uh, um, a, a combustion engine and an electric engine, there's a variant of the OBD protocol that you can use to, to calculate the share of the of the electric and the non-electric uh, 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 part, let's say, of your of your driving. And that is relevant for certain, actually for taxation reasons even, uh, in some countries, including Germany, and will be in the future. And so basically we are, we are thinking of uh, extending our app so that you can look into this e-share part for hybrid engines. Um, that is a, was a very nice idea, and we we got quite a lot of feedback. We did a bit of publicity, and so we we have by now we have we, I think we have uh, uh, sixty or so uh, cars that are donating us uh, data once in a while, right? They are not necessarily doing RDEs; they are also just putting it there and there and have their monitoring device on, and the data goes to us. Okay, that was my story. Um, uh, yeah, a bit about research, a bit about uh, uh, getting it out to the public, and a bit about real driving emissions. I should say that, of course, because it's not calibrated at all, what we are reporting is just indications of what's really happening with your car, right? These are not uh, fully compliant in a legal sense with the with the with um, what is needed if you really want to do an RD test, even though the specification is perfect. So that was it. Um, thanks for uh, your time. I think I am kind of good. Uh, we should uh, be able to take questions if you have some. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Holger. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? So uh, I could ask the first question. Oh, there is a question. Kerstin, please go ahead. Thank you very much for such a great talk. Um, uh, Holger, I was wondering, it's it's fantastic to see it's all open source, etc. It's a bit scary that uh, the public can um, 
access the OBD because that opens up all sorts of um, opportunities to, di to, to, to disrupt it or to frustrate it or to hack it. So, so uh, this is, but this is meant like that. It is the right of the, it is the right of the driver to access the OBD. This is absolutely. It's also the case that I mean, sometimes if you open a screw of your laptop, then your your liability goes away. Or so. This is not the case for the car. You are allowed as a customer to access the OBD. This is, is it, you, as an owner. It is your, it is your right, um, and it's meant like that. It is, it is. No, and so in this sense, I think we are good. Uh, I would say. I mean, um, of course. This there you can because this is a CAN bus behind, and of course the car companies are using the CAN bus for for other protocols and so forth. And every car manufacturer has, has their own protocol, and of course by that you can tap into uh, nasty functionality if you are a smart cookie and so forth. And definitely, definitely, yes. But I think that's just the problem because there's a plug there. I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the CAN bus has has very low security, if if, yeah. if any at all, um, yeah. Uh, yeah. in today's measures and. Uh, there is direct access to those parts of the um, vehicle control that you rely on, right? Such as the brakes. Um, I would, I would be surprised. I mean, let's say by OBD, you cannot. You can. I mean, let me also say it, it's like this. It is a diagnosis. It is, it is reporting data. So what we are doing is we are sending at the beginning. We are sending when we are connecting the plug and the and the app. We are con connect. Then we are sending a command, namely, tell us what data dimensions are supported and then it tells us the data dimensions then we send another command where we say which of them we want and these are the two let's say commands that we send and all the rest is just diagnosis so so data travels to us but we are not sending data to the car while the car is driving i also think it is not meant for that it's it's right it's not therapy it's only diagnosis uh, that is what it's meant for. Look into the car, but not not uh, do something in the car. I mean, yeah. conceptually, I'm not saying that this is safe in, or secure in any sense, but but, the, but conceptually, it's a diagnosis thing. You are allowed to look into your car. Of course, you should not interfere with the brakes. Now, whether it's possible, yes, likely it is because the data definitely. is traveling over the CAN bus. But OBD is not meant for, for braking, definitely not. Yeah? Yeah. Well, it, it, it is possible to break it with a very simple denial of service attack, unfortunately. You think so? Oh yeah, uh, we've done it. We've got a rig uh, where we've tried it out, and it's surprisingly um, well. It's not su not surprisingly. It's shockingly simple. So you basically say you're taking away compute power, and then the and then the car has no time to. You take away network network bandwidth, and then the communication between the critical components no longer works. It's pretty good. And that re requires a reset. Yeah, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can imagine. Okay, okay, good. <laughs> Cool. Nice. Nice. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Thanks, Thank Kirsten. Uh, are there other questions? Other questions? So, uh, Holger, could you say a bit more about the expressive power of this RT Lola? Uh, what can you specify as? A, so you said it's uh, mapping from input to output streams. Uh, could you talk about, for example, timestamps? Could you freeze timestamps and compare them, things like that? So you can, mm -hmm. and uh, with Ati Lola, uh, actually, uh, actually, this is this is supported. And um, let's say our first version was was not using Ati Lola but Lola, and there we were relying on the fact that since it is a limited thing we know it's the NEDC especially at the time it's only 20 minutes you can basically you can you can you can put this in the in the in the in the in the dimensions you can basically store 1200 dimensions and then you can you can basically take right i mean what i'm trying to say is you can you can uh, yeah you can you can flatten you can hammer down the the time domain into into more dimension and this is how we did it this way uh, before we had RT Lola. now with RT Lola, you can refer to that and i have a slide which i didn't show you which shows more or less the the the, the space complexity that arises from there um i am also not the the super expert in 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 lola what i can say what is missing is the fact that let's say from a from the perspective of measurement theory, there is no notion of noise, basically, right? So let's say confidence in measurement and so forth is not supported. Um, these kind of, let's say, statistical guarantees and so forth. This and this, I mean, uh, I, I know that some people are looking into this and how to integrate this now, but it may come with a redesign. 
uh, of, of the whole language. Yeah. And then do you think that can still be supported in an app? Because that could sometimes be time consuming. You're 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 right. You're right. I I, I mean I'm not I mean um yeah well what can I say? I mean um I do think that what we have and also the 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 expressiveness and beauty of of Lola has room for more application, but uh, whether they can be uh, extremely challenging um, or or what works and what does not work, I don't know. Here it is fairly easy. I mean, there there is no issue with with time or space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very. Uh, are there any further questions? We can take one more question before we close the meeting. Uh, maybe wait for a couple of seconds. Any more questions? No, if not, thank you very much, Holger, for this wonderful talk. Uh, I think there are lots of interesting applications ahead with this technology. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, in two weeks' time, we will have uh, Philippa Gardner, who is also, uh, I think, present today. And um, she will be talking about uh, other applications of formal methods. So uh, she will be talking about the language she has designed. I think it's called Gillian, if I remember well. And um, we are very much looking forward to that. Thank you all for being here and see you in two weeks. Thanks for the invite. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. So, Holger, I will share the, the recording later with you and then you can tell me if you want to cut out some, some bits and 